This board has a ton of hidden features that I've never seen on any Worship pedal board breakdown before. So stay tuned to see what this board has up its sleeves because I think you're gonna be surprised. Hey, so my name is John Holt, and today, like I said, we're gonna be breaking down my pedal board. I'm gonna to try to go in like the ideal chain of effects. Uh, you'll see why I say ideal in a second, but also just to let you know, this is entirely unscripted. Uh, I have some ideas of where I wanna take this thing, but it's unscripted. I don't have anything planned, so uh, bear with me a little bit. It's just gonna be, it's just gonna be an exploration of this board, an exploration of my thought press process on it but I want to say up front that this is a worship pedal board and that that's not because it can only do worship honestly I could play any genre you throw at me with this board it's an incredible board um, but I say it's a worship pedal board because every decision I made when it came to this board every pedal that made the cut every pedal that did not make the cut had to go through this process in my mind of asking the question does this help me worship better yes or no and if the answer was no or even i don't know then it just didn't make the cut uh everything that's on this board was meticulously thought of from that mindset of this is going to help me worship better and everything that is on this board has to achieve that purpose so there were a lot of pedals that i really wanted to put on this board that sound amazing but ultimately it didn't help me achieve the goal of worshiping better. Um, so it didn't make it. So my previous board before this one was a massive rig with a Mastermind PVC-10 on it. It was everything you would want in a pedal board. It had all the big box delays and big box reverbs. And uh, I, I carried around two tube amps with it. And it was just a huge rig, sounded amazing, don't get me wrong, but ultimately it was just way overkill. This board, I uh, had to accomplish two goals. Uh, the first one was the one that I was just talking about before. This board has to uh, help me worship Jesus the best I possibly can. Uh, that's first and foremost. Secondly, this board had to do the most within the smallest footprint possible. Uh, it needed to do it in the most lightweight way possible. So it's rare to see a pedal on my board that serves a singular purpose. There are one or two on here that are hidden away that are singular purpose things. That's just because that's the nature of the game for some of these things. Uh, but for the most part, I tried to pick pedals that served multiple purposes to get the most out of the limited amount of space that I had. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive in to this pedal board. Uh, it's a really unique one, and I think you're gonna find a lot of interesting features on here that aren't on really very many other boards, if any at all. Um, but we'll get to those things. But let me give you just my clean signal uh, up front. Basically, this is what I would be playing on a Sunday as my just clean signal. start from the ideal signal path that that I guess I use 95% of the time. So the first thing that's first is actually not the interfacer. You guys are probably thinking that it's the interfacer because most people plug in there, but I do it different, I'm, I'm weird. I have a, a wireless pedal because for me, like I said, everything needs to help me worship better and it is very, distracting to me. I'm a very passionate worshiper. You've probably seen that on my YouTube channel, but I like to worship Jesus to the full extent of my ability. So I move around a lot. That means that I like to be tied down to the stage the least amount as possible, if that makes sense. So one of the things that can tie you down is having a cable connected to you. Now, if I was going to a studio to record a session, would I use this wireless pack? Uh, 
Probably not. I mean, I have before uh, because it is just that good that you legitimately cannot tell the difference between the wireless pack and the cable. But for the sake of keeping everything as analog as possible, I probably wouldn't. But when it comes to live performance, uh, the difference between an actual cable and this wireless pack is negligible. I've never had an issue with any sort of interference. But before I keep going onto that, I just wanna say this is the Shure uh, GLDX16 Plus or something like that. I'll put the title on the screen. I'll have all this stuff linked below as well. Um, but the reason why I went with this one is because uh, well, there's a lot of reasons actually. One, like I was saying, everything's multi-purpose. So you can see that on the screen, um, it, I also have a tuner on here, which is telling me I'm a little flat. Um, so, sorry, got a tune, got a tune, got a tune. Um, but yeah, so I got a tuner on here and I have it set uh, so that when the tuner's on, it doesn't mute the guitar. So it's an always on tuner. Uh, so I, So if I play slide, for example, if I play slide, I know if I'm flat, if I'm sharp, and when I'm dead on, right? So that's very useful uh, to have, but that's not the only reason why I got this wireless uh, pack. I got it because it's one of those wireless packs that it sends out a signal on like five different channels or something like that. And it's constantly sweeping between frequencies to determine which signal is the cleanest and the strongest. Uh, and it'll automatically switch to that cleanest and strongest signal, which is one of the reasons why I've never had an issue with interference. Uh, I know other players that use this, and I've played on the same stage as other people who have been using the same system. I've never had an issue with it. It has great range uh, and great ability to switch between frequencies if it needs to. It also has incredible battery life, but that's enough about that. Uh, this is a great wireless pedal. If you're gonna go wireless on your board, I genuinely don't recommend any other wireless pedal than that. Uh, but speaking of signal, I totally skipped over the guitar that I'm using. Uh, this is a custom built uh, Veritas Riverton is what they're calling it now. It was the Mini Master before. Now they go by the name of Rivertons. Um, it's just like their offset style guitar. Uh, it is running their Pope pickups, which are uh, humbuckers. And yeah, I just, I love the guitar. It's uh, Swamp Ash, Maple Neck. Um, it is my dream guitar. I've been wanting this guitar for forever. And I finally got it just a few months ago. So it's a great guitar. I absolutely love it. Um, you've been hearing it on all my videos. So you already know what it sounds like. I will play it in just a second, but that's the guitar. She's my baby and I love her. <laughs> but from there, the wireless pack uh, goes out directly into the interfacer. Now, the reason why I decided to do this was because originally, when I first built this board, I didn't have the plus version of the wireless pack. I just had uh, the, the original standard version, which uh, unfortunately they discontinued and I needed to buy another uh, wireless pack for another guitar uh, that I was getting so that I could have, I just like to keep one wireless transmitter uh, with each guitar. So it's easy to just pull the guitar out of the case. I know I've got a wireless transmitter that works with my board. Uh, so I like to keep one transmitter with each of my guitars. But unfortunately, they stopped selling them and the uh, new ones aren't compatible with the old ones. Really unfortunate. And the old ones aren't compatible with the new ones. And to make it even more unfortunate, the old ones were selling for like the same price as the new ones. So I just decided to get rid of the old system and upgrade to the new one. But the old ones didn't have an input located on the back of the wireless pack, uh, or sorry, the wireless receiver. So uh, if I needed to dump my wireless pack and plug in with the actual cable, uh, the, there was no way really than to just plug into the next pedal in the line. So I made it easy on myself and I put the input into the input of the interfacer. So it would be really easy for me to just unplug the wireless uh, pack and then just plug my cable straight in. But now these new ones, if you're looking into them, the new ones, if the your wireless pack dies or something happens and your RF isn't working, like there's interference or whatever, uh, you can just plug straight into the second jack, and it'll. Uh, you can still use the the tuner on it. So if you're not using your wireless pack, this isn't a waste of space anymore. You can still use the tuner, which is fantastic. Um, so if 
I was building the board today, that's one thing that I would do different. Uh, I would rework my interface setup. But right now, the sure is going into the input of the interfacer, which is buffered. And then that is being sent to my boost. So this boost pedal is not just operating as a boost, it's actually also my volume pedal. So this volume pedal that you see here is also connected to the boost through uh, the, the just the basic input output jacks. It's basically acting as an expression pedal that is controlling the volume boost circuit inside of this pedal. So what's really cool is if the pedal is turned off, then this volume pedal still works as a volume pedal. It's just when you get to the top, that is basically unity. You're not getting any boost from it. But when you turn it on, when you swell up to the top, now you're getting a certain amount of boost. Um, if you have this turned all the way off, so or like all the way down, then that's unity. And then as you turn it up, obviously more boost, and it goes all the way up to 15 decibels of boost. So I use this uh, in two ways. One is as a volume pedal, um, but then the other way is to help manage the uh, signal differences between my guitars. So for example, uh, one of the guitars that I use a lot is a Telecaster. I love that classic Tele sound, but it's single coil pickups, which are a lot lower of an output than these humbuckers. These humbuckers have a very high output. So instead of having to regain stage my entire board, I use this boost pedal as a way to um, basically adjust the input gain of the guitar up front. So where I have this guitar set just a little uh, bit above unity, uh, because I like to push the front end of my overdrives just a little bit. If I pl if I plug in with my Telecaster, then I would probably bump it up to around uh, 12 o'clock just to kind of give it a equal input level before it hits my compressors and my overdrives and all that stuff. But the real reason why I went with this is because I can't tell you how many times I have used volume pedals that just squeak. They are either very unreliable or they just squeak. Everyone knows the problem with the VP Junior with the string breaking, it's happened to almost everyone. If it hasn't happened to you yet, you've got a ticking time bomb on your pedal board. Fix it. <laughs> no, I. they're great. That's a great shape of a, a volume pedal. I love the size of that volume pedal uh, and the way it feels for sure, but it's just too unreliable. I've also had uh, a really nice volume pedal. Everyone recommends it. Everyone loves it. Uh, it squeaked like crazy for me. And so I like it didn't matter how much I cleaned it. Uh, I tried everything and that pedal just it, it gave me crackle noises in my swells. It didn't I, I'm telling you, I cleaned the pots. I cleaned everything and it just did not cooperate with me. It, it didn't work. So I switched to this boost pedal because now the volume circuit is not going through this volume pedal, so it doesn't matter how noisy or disgusting this volume pedal gets, uh, which I still try to maintain it the best I can, but it doesn't matter because the volume control is not going through this volume pedal. It's going through this boost, uh, which I know for a fact is not gonna give me any uh, crackling artifacts in this sound, so it's gonna be a perfect swell. Who knew you could talk so long about volume pedals? Love it. But every every worship guitarist needs one. But moving on, this goes directly into the brain of my board. Uh, this is the uh, Mastermind PBC6X from RJM Music Technology. Guys, if you've never heard of RJM, if you've never heard of the, the pedal board controller, the PBC, the Mastermind, guys, Look it up, because this has changed the game for me. Uh, this is the definition of me asking, will it help me worship better? And the answer being an emphatic yes. Um, this basically allows you to have a fully analog system, or you know, I know that I have some digital on here, but uh, just imagine it's all analog. I mean, all of this is, these are not, we'll get to that but you can have a whole fully analog system and 
treat it almost like it's a digital system where you hit one button and everything changes. It has two modes. One is like the preset mode, which you see, um, I pulled up another one, which is song by elevation. Is this just a preset that I used on my tutorial video that's on the channel that you probably saw. And so I have like the intro set here and you can see that things changed on my pedal board. Uh, I have a different preset pulled up on my Zoya, a different preset on the Specular Tempest, which we'll get to those. Uh, but you can also see that uh, some of the pedals turned on and turned off inside the loop. Uh, then I switched to a clean setting, which again, changed the different presets. I turned off my overdrives and now I have an overdrive setting turned on one of my overdrives, changed the setting on my reverb. But then you can see that I went from my drive over here to the distortion side of this pedal. So basically what this does is it's an analog looper, meaning it has an analog signal uh, going to and from each pedal individually. So instead of daisy chaining, like going from one pedal to the next, to the next, to the next, like a lot of pedal boards, instead I'm doing it in loops. Like it, so it's not series, it's in loops. So I have one individual loop going out into one pedal and then a completely independent loop going out to another pedal. And so each pedal is in its own little circle, and then I'm just telling the mastermind which pedal I want the signal to go through and which pedal I want it to bypass completely. And a simple way of putting it, it basically allows me to turn my analog pedals on and off with one button push. Uh, and then also what this is doing is it's sending out MIDI control signals, like command signals, to my digital pedals uh, and even my analog pedals. So these two pedals, which we're about to get to, are analog pedals, but they take MIDI commands. So basically that's just a signal coming from the mastermind, the brain of this pedal board that says, hey, change this setting and do this instead. Go to this preset, go to this setting. Uh, and it's doing that to all my different pedals. So I can hit one button and then everything changes to be the sound that I need. So I can demo that. This would be the intro to another one, right? Anyways, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just messing around. But that just shows you genuine, like generally what this pedal does. Uh, it allows me to change anything that I want. Now outside of allowing me to change different things, why is this important? Well, one, it helps me troubleshoot this board. So if I'm getting like a weird issue with my pedal board, whether a I'm losing signal or one, one side of the signal is louder than the other, uh, which has happened before, uh, this allows me very easily to go through the pedals and figure out which one is the problem. So I can go into this loop setting now. So if you don't want to make presets, you can still treat this like a daisy chained pedal board. And you can see all the different pedals that I have in the loop here. So you can see I have my bloom on, then I can turn on morning glory. I can turn on uh, the Asabi. It allows me to go pedal by pedal and see what is the problem. So like, here's my tone without anything. This is just straight guitar, not even the, uh, not even the amp model. So basically I can see that, or I can hear that I'm getting good signal coming through. Now let's turn on the first pedal. Okay. I've got good signal there too. Just so it doesn't sound horrible. I'm going to turn on the amp modeling. Sounds, sounds good, right? All right. So basically I can go through and check which pedal is being the problem child, right? But another thing that is really important about this is that it gives you the cleanest signal possible, which means that my signal is only running through the pedals that it absolutely has to be running through. Meaning if I want a clean 
signal, like a clean sound, it's not gonna be running through any of my overdrives in the off position. It's just bypassing that loop 100% completely. So I have less cable length that I have to run through, which means the less chance of interference gives me the cleanest signal out possible. So this isn't just a tool that allows me to work less. This is a tool that actually helps you sound better and problem solve easier. Uh, this is a complete game changer. I could go on and on about this pedal for hours. One other thing that this pedal is great for, this Mastermind, is that uh, the X on the PBC6X means that it is a matrix type circuit, which means that it's I'm able to rearrange the loop order of my pedals. So if you're daisy chaining pedals, you're stuck with this is pedal one, this is pedal two, this is pedal three, this is pedal, you know, so on and so forth. But with this one, I can tell it between presets even, not even between songs, but between presets. I can say, you know what? I want my overdrive one to come after overdrive two. So put this one as overdrive one and then put this as overdrive two. But in the next preset, I want this to be, to be overdrive one and overdrive two. You can even say, I wanna put my delays after my reverbs for this next preset. But for this next one, I want my delays before my reverbs. Um, I play around with that a lot because what you'll see is these two pedals do multiple things. So depending on what I need from each preset or each song, uh, section, uh, these loop orders might change just depending. Uh, so this was really important that it, I could easily change loop orders uh, and it does that. So that is another reason why I went with the PBC6X. If you want more of a breakdown onto this pedal, how I program my presets, everything that I do uh, MIDI wise, uh, let me know down below because I would love to maybe give this pedal its own dedicated video. So if that sounds good to you, uh, let me know down below because I'm curious to know if you wanna hear more about it. But anyways, with all that out of the way, let's get back into it. I, let me give you just my clean signal uh, up front. Basically, this is what I would be playing on a Sunday as my just clean signal. Um, so I have a global preset, which is basically uh, a clean ambient sound, but for the sake of uh, demonstration, I'm gonna turn off all my wet effects and we're just gonna hear my clean sound. So this is straight out of the guitar. Uh, the only thing that you're hearing is my guitar into my amp modeling pedal, which is the Boss GT 1000 core, we'll get to that. Uh, so this is just my clean sound. So that's all three pickup positions, uh, just clean straight through. Now I'm gonna turn on the compressor, which uh, I leave on 100% of the time. That's just because I'm able to MIDI control it with my mastermind. Uh, so I will control the intensity, like the strength of the, the compression, but this is like full strength compression that you would hear on a Sunday. Uh, so I don't always run it this strong, but this is kind of the extent of how compressed I would run it. The reason why I wanted to show you that is because um, that is like the extent of how much compression I would use. Uh, usually it's a lot more tasteful than that, 
Um, but I wanted to show you kind of the both extremes, no compression and all the comp compression, because I like to use my amps and my drive section a little bit different than a lot of other guitarists. Um, I come from the, the tube amp kind of era. Like, I love tube amps, and it took me a long time to get into the digital modeling uh, community. Uh, I just love the way the tube amps sound and the way they feel and respond. Um, not to be, not to be like stuck up or anything. I'm not one of those people. Now I'm hardcore all the way in to digital modeling. It has saved my back many years of existence from not having to carry amps. <laughs> but um, I still think of this board in terms of how I would think about a board in the analog kind of era analog kind of days. Um, so I'm running my two modeling amps a little bit hotter than most people. Uh, a lot of people love big headroom uh, so they can put as many pedals through it as possible and you're just acting as like a, a bed for that sound and you're only shaping the tone a little bit. I like to have my amps what we call on the edge of breakup which means that if you play really softly and quietly, it's clean. But if you use a lot of heavy picking dynamics and you're really digging in, then you get a little bit of grit uh, on your amp. So it, it begins to break up. It begins to distort a little bit. It begins to overdrive. Uh, so basically, I'm treating my amp as a first stage overdrive. So let me give you an example of that. I'm going to pick softly at first, and you can hear how it's clean. And then when I dig in, how it really begins to overdrive. And it sounds very similar to what a lot of other people have as their first stage overdrive. So let's do that. So I personally really like to allow my right hand, my picking hand, to determine how much breakup my amp is getting. Uh, so that's why I wanted to show you the extent of no compression versus all the compression, because now I'm going to turn my compression on, and you can see how little my picking hand has to do with how much my amp is breaking up. Now it's pretty consistent no matter how I pick. So this is uh, like full compression. I'm just messing around. But you can see how it doesn't really matter if I'm picking softly or if I'm really digging in. There is not a whole lot of dynamic range to my picking. Uh, it does, uh, even at the, the high end of all of my compression, it's not perfectly squashing it to a, a fine line. So I do have a little bit of control still. Um, but it's not, a, it's not nearly as much as what I had before. And so that can be useful in certain situations. Like if I'm playing like a poppy opener song and I need a lot of that rhythmic compression, uh, then that's great. 
but if I'm playing a part that really needs me to to go from uh, no overdrive at all to like that that glistening kind of overdrive that's on top of your clean signal, then I'm not going to have as much compression because I want to be able to have those dynamics. So that's my bloom. Also, it does have uh, the bloom part of the compressor. So it's not a clean boost. It actually does get some overdrive on it. So if I want just a little bit of boost to give it a little bit more grit, I can throw that on there. Or it can get real crazy if I really crank that. Yeah, so that's a lot of fun to experiment around with. Uh, is just a tradition, like a non-traditional boost, a boost that has some grit to it. Everyone loves clean boost these days. Don't get me wrong, I love them. I got one on my board, but having something that is not as clean is a lot of fun to mess around with. But that is my uh, amp sounds. That is my compression. Let's move on to my actual overdrives. This is gonna be a long video, isn't it? Jeez, okay. So my compression, now because this can change loop orders, sometimes this isn't always true, but typically I have my Morning Glory as my first stage overdrive. Uh, this is a Morning Glory version four. It's the latest version, so I think that that's version four. And I actually reached out to JHS to see if I could get their pearl and gold limited edition color scheme that was done for the V3 uh, on the V4. Because I wanted the V4 with the, the gain switch to go from blue mode to red mode. But I wanted it in the, the white and gold look because I've kind of got a color scheme going on here, you know. And I didn't want to ruin the color scheme. Which, it wouldn't have ruined it, I actually still would have fit. But I like this, so I asked for it, they gave it to me. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a one of one, I, I would be surprised if it was. But, because I, I think I actually know someone that has one of these, but I don't know if it's the V3 or the V4, I think it's the V4. So, but it is something that I specifically custom asked for. So this is like the crown jewel of my board. I love this, because not very many people have, everyone has this pedal. Not very many people have this pedal though, you know? One thing that I'm about to change is I'm going to have a cable going from the mastermind to this to be able to activate the red remote. Currently, I don't have that. Uh, so just wherever this gain switch is set is where it's set. But soon, I am gonna be able to uh, tell the pedal when to switch from which one. So then I would basically have two gain stage pedals in one. But right now, I have it set to the red because like I was saying with my amps, I like to run my amps a little bit heavier than most people. So with the Morning Glory, I don't need the light overdrive like sparkly bits on top. Like I already got the amp sparkle. Um, so this is like full on overdrive and I love it. It's uh, the Morning Glory, if you don't know anything about it, it's based off of Blues Breaker Circuit. So it's a fairly transparent sound meaning it doesn't do much to color the EQ curve of your guitar. What you get in is what you get out, just more overdrive, right? Uh, so I love that about the Morning Glory circuit uh, or the Blues Breaker circuit that the Morning Glory is based on. It's as close to transparent as you can get. So let me go ahead and turn on the Morning Glory. So you can see I've got uh, the Bloom on, the Morning Glory, and then um, just my, my amps and that's it, cool. It's overdrive. Uh, typically, I don't play overdrive that clean. I'll have my delays and reverbs on, um, so I'll give you a little taste of what that sounds like. So 
So just out of the Morning Glory, I'm getting a lot of dynamic range. You know, even if I turned off my overdrive, or sorry, my compressor, So one of the things that you notice that I did there is uh, I actually like to play with the volume knob and tone knobs on my guitar. You have these knobs for a reason. And if you utilize the actual tools that you have on your guitar, you don't need as much gear on your pedal board as you think. So that's why I don't have a typical stage one overdrive. I have a very heavy first stage overdrive for most people. That's because if I need less overdrive, then I can do one of two things. I can either turn this off and then dig in harder and get the overdrive for my amps, or if I need more than that, then I can just keep both on and turn the volume knob down a little bit, and that'll clean up your guitar signal a lot. You can do a lot with just your volume knob. So I highly recommend everyone to just mess around with your the volume knob on your guitar because I guarantee you, you can save a lot more space on your pedal board than you think. You don't need eight stages of overdrive. I know every overdrive sounds different, but does it help you worship Jesus better? I don't know. For me, it's just more to think about. Uh, so I like to figure out what my tone is, what my sound is, and then just simplify. You know, what is my tone? What is my sound? And just keep it to that. Cool. So that is the Morning Glory. Next is the Asabi. This is a fun one because it is an overdrive and a distortion. And I control it through MIDI from, you know, the Mastermind PBC 6X. And it's really easy for me to be able to switch from the drive to the distortion side of things. The Asabi is a signature pedal from uh, Mateus Asado. He partnered with Jackson Audio, which is also the company that made the Bloom. So these two pedals are by the same company, if you couldn't tell from them just looking similar. So this overdrive is based more off of a tube screamer circuit. It's basically, the way they describe it, is a tube like a tube screamer without the dramatic mid-range hump in the EQ frequency. It still has a little bit, from my, from my experience, it still has a little bit of a, a mid-hump to it, which is good because it still makes it a tube screamer, but it's not as pronounced and dramatic, uh, which I like. I, I like the tube screamer. I want to like the tube screamer, I should say but it's mid-range is just a little too harsh for me sometimes. So I actually love this. Uh, and I'll switch between the Morning Glory and the Overdrive side of the Asabi quite a bit, just because they're two different flavors, right? You have one that is a blues breaker, one that is a tube screamer. What's really exciting about the Asabi is that it has five different clipping types per side. So it has five different clipping types for the overdrive and five different clipping types for the distortion side. Uh, typically, my favorite is the asymmetric. Uh, so if you have one of these, try out the asymmetric. It's usually one of my favorites. It just has that like gnarly grittiness to it. It's not very smooth. Uh, I don't like my overdrives to be like crystal smooth. I like them to have some grit to them. Uh, so that's what I got here. And dude, I just... I've got this thing dimed, bro. Like this overdrive to the max, bro. So let's hear this over this Asabi. So that's the overdrive that I have. Similar to the uh, Morning Glory, if I need less, do you just turn down your, your volume knob? You got it on your guitar, bro. You got it on your guitar. You don't need another overdrive pedal. 
You don't need another overdrive pedal. I am your wallet telling you. I am prophesying over your bank account right now. Bro, you don't need another overdrive pedal. Trust me on this one. You're good. You got 12. You're good. I'm just playing. I'm choking. I love you. You know that I love you. Anyways, here's the distortion side. Uh, this, I only use the distortion side of this when it's getting crazy. Like, I mean, Holy Spirit revival crazy, okay? So, uh, but this has got all the gain you need. It's got all the gain you need. I do it I don't even know <laughs> I'm sorry about that guys I never play that way uh, let me tune back to standard because that's that's some nonsense let me tell you this is I'm not even joking you just witnessed the very first time I ever tuned this guitar to drop D that's a thing and it's living on YouTube forever this guitar's never been in drop D and I was proud to say that but now it's it's soiled no, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm messing with all you guys. I used to be a metalhead, okay? I used to rock and roll, bro. Rock and roll. I used to be a metalhead. Not anymore. And you can tell why. Back on track. Stay focused. Stay focused. Okay, that's metal out of the way. I'm telling you, this board can do anything. But realistically, I really just use this when I'm like full on just like tremolo picking single notes. Um, so, yeah, things like... That's uh, that's basically what I use the distortion for. So it it's it comes on at the very end of songs and that's about it. If I need like a, a rad guitar solo, but this has uh, the ability to cycle through gain stages and everything as well. This is another pedal that needs a whole tutorial breakdown on. So if you're interested, let me know. But I basically send MIDI commands that say, "Hey, give me uh, seventy five percent. Give give me." 25% gain on this pedal. Give me 50% gain on this pedal. Give me 75% gain. Give me 100% gain on this pedal. So I have a good range of how, like, how much gain I'm getting from it. Uh, so yeah, th there's there's a lot that I can go into on the Asabi. Uh, so if you want to know more, let me know. Uh, originally on here, I had the Broken Arrow, uh, which is the same thing as the the drive side of this pedal, but I just found with that pedal I needed I needed just a little bit more because even though I'm not a metal head, like come on, bro. Sometimes you just need a little bit more, you know. And I, I wasn't getting it with that. So this perfect, love it, spot on. But that is the dry side of the board. That is the overdrives, the boosts, the you name it. That's it. Uh, now we're moving on to the, the fun digital stuff. This side of the board gets a little wacky and a little crazy. First off, let me talk about the Specular Tempest because it's the easiest one. I know you're all staring at the Zoya, and you have been. You've been wondering, what the heck is this nonsense with all the flashy, flashy buttons? I'll get to that. But let's talk about 
this one first, the Specular Tempest. The Specular Tempest is what I use mainly for reverb. Uh, it is capable of doing delays and reverbs, uh, but typically, 95% of the time, I use it for reverb. Uh, I mostly keep it on a plate reverb. I'm a plate reverb kind of guy. And I have one setting that I use for the vast majority of the time. Uh, and then I just send MIDI signals to control the blend. So that reverb has a pretty decently long tail. I forget exactly how long. I think it's about, geez, seven seconds or something. It's wild. Um, but it, it, cut, it drops down pretty easy or pretty quickly. So and then it just stays in the background. So if I turn the blend down a lot, uh, that tail disappears quite a bit and it doesn't get mushy. Uh, when I'm The trick with your, your reverbs, and I'll go into a full video on this one day. The trick with your reverbs is you need a good amount of pre-delay on it. Basically, that just means give your reverb a split second to kick in. So you can still hear the clean tone of your guitar come through uh, before the reverb just washes over. Uh, that way, you, you still get a distinct, defined guitar tone plus the, the beautiful characteristics of your reverb without getting too muddy. So that's the trick there. And then I just MIDI control the blend, uh, and that's my reverb sound. So uh, basically, here's like a light reverb that I'll use. Sorry, let me turn the delay off. So basically it just acts as like a good bed behind what I'm playing when it's very low. But then when I really need some ambience, like wild ambience, turn the blend up and we, we got you. Yeah, so it, it's got a lot behind it. Um, and it's really easy to control with that blend that I just MIDI send from the RJM. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, every now and then, depending on what the Zoya is doing, uh, I will send this to a um, tape delay or a dotted eighth, like a digital dotted eighth kind of delay. Um, and then I can switch loop orders for this if I need it. Uh, but for the most part, it sits on a plate reverb. Uh, and then for the Zoya, the Zoya, uh, which one is the Zoya? Here it is. Uh, so the Zoya, most of the time I have this on a tape delay that has, that's in stereo. One side is a dotted eighth and then another side is a quarter note. You can hear that here. Uh, sorry, you can hear that here. Kind of fun, right? Love it. So honestly, I love delay. Uh, delay is probably one of my favorite effects, more so than reverb, definitely more so than modulation, uh, which I, I love all those things, but I think delay is one of my favorite effects just because you can do so much with it. Uh, people don't really realize how much delay does, uh, and in some cases, you can even use delay to almost substitute as like a reverb as well. Um, you can go anywhere from like a slapback delay, which can just add some thickness to like some rhythm playing, all the way to like washy tape delay settings that almost sound like washy reverbs. So tape delay is definitely my favorite type of delay. Uh, I think that stems from back when I was really playing a Telecaster as my main guitar. I didn't have a tremolo. And so when I got to like ambient portions of a set, I didn't have like a vibrato or anything uh, to, to give me some of that ethereal washiness. So what I did was I used a tape delay 
and just turned up the wow and flutter, like that modulation and the tape delay, and it got me there. Uh, and so I didn't really even have to use any sort of tremolo system to be able to get what I was looking for. Uh, and so I just fell in love with tape delay then because I really started to experiment with it. So the majority of time I have this on a tape delay, even if I have it set to something very subtle, um, most of the time I have it in a tape delay. So uh, yeah, you can see it flashing around. What's really cool is these uh, buttons kind of interact with what I'm playing. <laughs> But the Zoya is my main multi-effects pedal. Uh, it does all of my weird modulation stuff. It has some crazy stuff in there. So for like another one, uh, the intro has a chorus. So I have a chorus on here. switches back to a tape delay. Um, so I, I use the Zoya for a lot of my multi-effect stuff. Uh, basically, the Zoya can do anything you ask it to, but it's one of those pedals that you kind you, it's imagine you had a, a circuit board in front of you with a whole bunch of like diodes and transistors and bucket brigade kind of delay units and stuff. And you could build whatever you wanted that's what the, the Zoya is, just in digital form. Imagine it's a uh, old school analog like synthesizer with the cables that you patch, ba like patch base synthesizers, where you have cables that you patch one effect into the next, and you have this massive wall of cables, right? That's what this is, but in digital form. Uh, I actually am going to do a video that breaks down this and my thought process behind this because I could go on for way too long about this. But basically, I have uh, tape delays and digital delays and chorus and tremolos, vibratos. Uh, do you name it, I got it. It's in here. Reverbs, I've got different reverbs in there. Um, yeah, some some super crazy stuff like... It can do some really cool stuff. It can also do some really funky stuff like, um, I don't know. I don't know what this is. It, it's cool though. It's like a weird reverse looper thing. It, it's interesting. What's wild is I can play piano on my pedal board. You ready for this? Hold on. You got you, you ain't ready for this. Wild stuff. Why would I want to do that? I have no clue. But do I want to do it? Yeah, I do. Anyways, I'm going to do a deep dive on the Zoya because it's freaking rad, man. Uh, but yeah, I just use it for my modulation and my delays for the most part. Uh, but that's really it. Now to touch really quickly on my amp modeling choice, uh, I know the Boss GT1000 core is a little bit of a uncommon choice. Uh, I've actually been getting a lot of comments about it because today you see a lot of people with uh, the HX Stomp, which is great. I used to have, the, the HX Stomp used to be where this is now. So I used to have that on my board for sure. And I loved it, it was great. And a lot of people have the Iridium, a lot of people are using the Universal Audio stuff now, uh, Tone X or whatever it's called. Uh, those, they're great pedals, uh, they really are. 
Uh, but this was the best one for me for a multitude of reasons. One, because I, like I was saying earlier, I come from actually playing through tube amps and I found that going digital, it wasn't an issue with sound. Uh, I would listen back to my playing and it would sound like a tube amp. Uh, it, it was great. But the issue was with the feel. Uh, when I, For some reason, when I played through other digital modeling systems, they just it felt like a computer. It sounded amazing, but it felt like I was playing through a laptop or something. And the Boss GT1000 Core was, the first time I played through it, it was like, dude, that's what a tube amp feels like. And so it was more, it was less about the sound and it was more about the way it felt. Does it sound amazing? Yes. The the Boss GT1000 core sounds amazing. If it didn't sound amazing, it wouldn't be on my board, trust me. But here's the big thing. If you don't feel confident in your playing, you're not gonna be confident in your playing. If you don't feel like you sound good, then you're not gonna sound good. Um, so much of this instrument is based off of the way it, you feel playing it. That's one of the biggest factors in you developing your tone and your sound and your unique identity is just the way that you're, you feel your instrument. And if you're struggling to feel your instrument the way that you know that you could or should, uh, that's, a, that's a big problem and that's a big inhibitor to you being the best musician possible. And so for me, I know that there are a lot of other great sounding options out there, uh, but this one, for some reason, just connected with me and the way that it responded. Because when you play guitar, it's almost like a dialogue, you know, between you, your instrument, and your amp. And when you don't have an amp, that's a big part of the conversation that is gone. And so your board needs to make up for that. And so this pedal really does it. Uh, if you've never played through one, I highly recommend it. For some reason online, the only people that are playing it are like metalheads, which nothing wrong against, like nothing against that. There's nothing wrong about that. Uh, but I see very little people using it for like a worship pedal board or anything outside of the metal genre. Uh, but it has some amazing stuff in there. So maybe I'll do another breakdown on that one as well. Uh, another reason why I got it was because it's processing power. If for whatever reason there's an effect on this board that I can't find and I can't make, the chances of the GT1000 core having it, 100%. Uh, like for example, I really struggled to figure out how to do uh, a reverse delay on the Zoya. Turns out you can't really do it. Um, there's some workarounds like that reverser thing that I was playing earlier, it's weird. And it gets close, but it's not quite there. So I play all of my reverse delays on the Boss GT1000 core, and I'll, I program that to have a certain uh, MIDI code. And so I just send that MIDI signal to the pedal and it turns on my reverse delay. So it has a bunch of processing power and it comes with basically all of the 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 boss effects like the legendary boss effects so if there's something from boss that you like it's in here like you want their shimmer reverb it's in here uh you want the slicer it's in here you want a reverse delay it's in here um uh, it's octave stuff it's in there it allows me to do everything i could possibly ever want uh, i did find that the helix like the hx stomp was a little limiting um because I like to run IRs with stereo amps and everything. And by the time you did all that, you ran out of the, the amount of blocks that it could process. Where the Boss GT1000 core, it has a lot of quirks and it's weird and I struggle with its software, but the, the playing experience is so much better and different, at least for me. Then just the cherry on top, the extra bonus, is that I, I get any effect that I could possibly want out of it. So I highly recommend looking into that pedal. I'm gonna do a video, I think, where I break down everything, how I use this pedal. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on the GT1000 core. It's a great pedal. Are there other 
pedals out there that compete with it, 100%. Uh, and you're not wrong for choosing any of the other ones. You're not. Uh, we're at a point where pedals just sound amazing. These amp mod modeling pedals sound insane. So it's hard to go wrong with one these days. Uh, but this was the one that just fit me. All right, guys. But with all that out of the way, that is basically my signal path but there is so much more to this pedal board than just the signal path of the board. And honestly, there's a lot of stuff in this board that I've never seen any other pedal board do. And I don't wanna hype it up too much because at the end of the day, it's, it's not like this thing could drive me to work. You know, I wish, like that would be the best pedal board ever. But, uh, it, it does solve a lot of issues beyond just playing guitar as well. And it does a lot of wild stuff. Firstly, some things that not a lot of people talk about, the wiring, let's talk about it, right? Uh, these are, I, this is all custom. You can see from the, the rat's nest down here, I actually need to clean this up. It's not the neatest wiring job. Uh, I, I, could, I could do better, but I hand wired all this myself uh, and it's a lot of crazy stuff. It's a lot of crazy stuff. For example, the PBC6X, it does stereo but it has just a singular input and output for stereo, which means you need to have a Y splitter cable, which is basically uh, mono left and right on one end that combines to one stereo jack. So it's like, it makes like a Y, right? So you need to have two of those per pedal that's stereo, because you need to have a stereo in and a stereo out, like a stereo send and return. So you have two of those per stereo pedal so like, that's a lot of weird brain messing stuff already. But then there's so much, so many different standards of MIDI and this board takes all of it. So for example, there's your standard MIDI, which is like this pedal that has the five pin MIDI connector. That's great. But this pedal for some reason only has a MIDI in, there's no MIDI out or MIDI through or anything like that. So I can't pass MIDI from this pedal to the next. So MIDI ends here, right? But then this is the only pedal on this board that takes five pin MIDI. So the five pin MIDI here has to go to a MIDI converter pedal, which is underneath this pedal. Uh, you can kind of see these jacks going in and out underneath here. Uh, this doesn't, it doesn't connect to this pedal. It actually goes underneath the pedal because I have a MIDI like transforming box there that converts from five pin MIDI to TRS MIDI. And so I have TRS MIDI going to uh, these pedals and the Zoya. The Zoya takes TRS MIDI as well. So I got four different pedals that do TRS MIDI, but this pedal doesn't do normal TRS MIDI. It does 3.5 millimeter TRS MIDI. So not only is it not like five pin MIDI, it's not the quarter inch TRS MIDI that everything else takes. It's like the headphone jack type of MIDI. So I had to get headphone jack cables and custom solder them to mic cables that go to stereo TRS jacks. It's just, it's, it's insane. It's madness. The, t the MIDI on this board really genuinely melted my brain. But what's crazy is it works. So the MIDI solutions of, uh, on this board are absolutely insane. You don't, wanna, you don't wanna see, you don't wanna see the amount of crazy solder points I have on these cables to make this stuff work. It's crazy. But you're thinking, hey, MIDI is nothing new. Wild MIDI solutions have been a thing for a long time, which is fair. That's true. And we need to we need to standardize MIDI because this is crazy, guys. But that's not what's really crazy about this board. This board has a lot of, of digital pedals. And with digital pedals comes user interface applications on phones and laptops and stuff. And uh, ain't nobody got time to plug in 18 different USB cables to your board. So what I did was I custom built USB cables for all of these pedals. 
so that they would be the perfect length to run on this board and then terminate into a USB hub. So all of my digital pedals, except for the Zoya, because the Zoya, I love it, but it's ridiculous. You have to update it through micro SD card. If you wanna change your patches or update or upload patches, you gotta micro SD card it. And that's crazy. Give me a Mark II that has a USB or something. So anyways, the point is, all of these pedals, the, the Mastermind, the Boss, the Specular Tempest, they all connect, like I have USB uh, ports plugged in and it all connects to a USB hub that is underneath the jacks. You can kind of maybe make out the connections, the USB connections, but it's underneath the jacks for the MIDI converter that I have. But what's crazy again, is that all of these pedals have different types of USBs. So these two take USB type B, but then this one takes micro USB. It's not even USB-C, it's like micro USB, which is just crazy to me. And I had to figure out how to hand wire all of those USB cables, absolutely crazy. Oh, and also the power supply, we haven't even talked about the power supply yet, guys. The power supply on this thing, so I'm running the uh, Fender engine room level infinity. I don't, I don't know, I think it's level 11. It's whatever their biggest one is. Uh, and I'm using every port on that thing, it's crazy. Uh, but what's cool about it is that it also has a USB-C and USB-A uh, output. So you can charge like your phone and stuff. But what's cool is the USB-C is actually, I think it's like 18 volts out. So it has a pretty high output. And so I'm running a USB-C cable out of the power supply into my USB hub. And you've probably been wondering the whole time, what's this cable on the side doing? Well, this is a USB-C cable that I then run to my laptop on stage, and that will allow me to connect with one cable. It will allow me to connect to all of my digital pedals, except for the Zoya, unfortunately. Please, Empress, if you're watching, update the Zoya to allow USB. Like, give me a Mark II, please, please. Um, but I'm able to connect all of them. So if I need to make a change to any of my presets, I can. If I wanna edit my presets or change songs or uh, like say we're at a worship night where there's a lot of flowing and they decide last minute, hey, we wanna add in this one song to, uh, to the set. No problem, bro, I got you. And the chances are, because I've been playing with this board long enough, I already got that song stored in the bank. So all I've got to do is drag and drop. Yes, I can go into menus and like, we've got all the menus on this board and I, I could do it all on the pedal itself, but it's 10 times easier doing it on the laptop. So I'll just run this cable to my laptop, plug it in and send the change over to the board and it's great. But what's cool is because I have it connected to the power supply, I can power my laptop off the USB-C cable which is so dope because that means I only need one cable to run my laptop. I don't need to have the USB-C cable coming off and a power cable. I can just have one cable to do it. Now it's not the 90 watts or whatever that the big thick power supply delivers, but if all I'm doing is monitoring things or running tracks or something, uh, it's enough to keep my laptop going. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to charge it to the, the max level, but it'll keep it from draining to zero for a whole day. So that's great. It's amazing. But that's not even it guys, because it's USB-C. I'm able to send and receive MIDI commands to and from my laptop. So I can basically have, uh, I have a preset on here that's called Ableton. And if I'm running tracks, I can tell it song one, go to song two, go to song three, you know, whatever. And it will allow me to play, stop, solo the click of any 
song on Ableton and I'll be able to control or whatever whatever software you're using. If you're using playback for multi-tracks, that's a great soft piece of software. Um, but it will allow you to control it. What's even more sick is you can put MIDI programs in Ableton or in playback and have playback when it hits like the chorus automatically send a MIDI signal to my pedal board that tells my pedal board jump to the the preset for the chorus. So essentially, once I hit play on the tracks, I don't have to touch my pedal board once until we get to like a flow section, which is absolutely insane. Now, uh, it, I don't do that all the time because uh, for the most part, I'm not MDing anymore. I'm not controlling the tracks anymore. Uh, we pass that off to another person on the team. Sandra, if you're watching this, you're the bro, captain, my captain. Uh, he's the man, the myth, the legend, Sandro. He's the best. But it's been a little bit since I've done tracks. But when I do tracks, that's how I that's how I run my pedal board, which is absolutely insane. And that is why I only have a handful of pedals, but a complete mess of wiring on this board. It's absolutely insane. I'm running full stereo, plus USB, plus MIDI. Uh, it's crazy. And the, the best part of it all is I only have to plug in two cables for audio, one cable for power, and you're off to the races. It's the best. Is there more stuff on this board that I could talk about? 100%. Yeah, there is. Uh, if you want to see how I program the Mastermind, please let me know. Uh, other things that I can't live without on this board. I've got a spot right in between these pedals for my slide. Uh, I'm not a slide guy. I don't like playing slide all that often, but yo, you can't you can't be a worship pedal board without a place for your slide. So you you can't leave the house without a slide. And then also capo. Hey, if you're a real guitarist, you don't need one of these. I, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm capo police. Come get you. No, capos have a place for sure. Um, but as a lead guitarist, it's rare when I use it. It's only specific use case scenarios. I don't use it as a crutch or anything, neither should you, but it's a tool that every guitarist needs on their pedal board. So I never leave the house without, uh, without my slide and without my capo. Uh, it's pretty rad. And then all of this packs into a Pelican flight case, hard shell case from Pelican that uh, is the perfect size for this custom uh, cutouts for this and everything. Uh, and inside that, I always have backup DI boxes just because you, you can never rely on someone else having a DI box for you. Uh, so I have really high quality DI boxes in my uh, Pelican case at all times. And then I also have a spare set of strings uh, and some other tools as well. And so what I do is I walk into the venue, I have my guitar in one hand and my pedal board in the other, and that's it. I have everything that I need from picks to extra strings to I have a extra quarter inch cable in case for whatever reason my pack dies or I'm having RF issues in the venue, then I can just plug in with my cable. That's pretty much it. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this pedal board breakdown, it's not just because you guys have been asking for it, which thank you so much if you've been asking for it. Uh, it means a lot to know that you're curious. But one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because there are some changes that I wanna make to this board. Uh, it's not the perfect rig. Uh, it's pretty dang close to it though. I've been using this pedal board for three years now, a little more than three years now. And I've only ever touched it once. That was to change out the HX Stomp with the GT1000 core. And that is about it. So this board has been this board for the better part of three years. And that's rare for a guitarist to just have a board and be happy with it. Uh, whenever there's something that I'm not happy with, this board is so flexible that I'm able to make adjustments and be happy with those adjustments instead of having to switch out pedals. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. But one thing that I would love to do is I'm thinking about it, like if you were to build this exact board, one of the things that I would suggest is instead of an interfacer, I would take a look at like the pinstripe pedals, Daiso Plus, uh, something along that those lines or like the wall, like Walrus Audio has a interfacer box that actually converts to a balanced 
XLR out and that's better like actually having a transformer that like gives you an actual balanced XLR out is better than just having a passive DI box for sure that converts from quarter inch to XLR. So I am definitely thinking about getting one of those uh, so it can be integrated neatly into my pedal board instead of having to carry around DIs and whatnot and rely on DIs. It's not every DI is built the same. So that's one of the things that I'm wanting to, to think about and switch out potentially. Like I said, one of the upgrades that I'm making soon is I'm gonna get a TRS cable uh, to go from the mastermind and just go straight to the morning glory. And that way I can easily switch between the normal morning glory blue side and then the extra gain red side just by pre-programming it. So that, that'll give me an extra stage of gain without having to mess with my volume knob too much. Again, all of these decisions have come down to, will it help me worship better? And if I add that TRS cable in there, the answer is yes. But will it help me worship better? Uh, I can't say no to any of these pedals. Every single pedal on this board has emphatically helped me worship better. This board offers pro tone with minimal effort on the back end on actual Sunday morning sessions. But that is a very, very exhaustive deep dive into this rig. But what's crazy is we barely touch the surface. I didn't even show you how I program this stuff. I haven't shown you the, the deep dive into the presets on the Zoya. Yeah, let me, got, let, let me know guys if you wanna to see more videos on this because uh, this this is my love language. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching this pedal board breakdown of my rig. You've been hearing it in all of my tutorials and covers and all that, and now you know what's going on. You can take a look at it and kind of have an idea of what's happening. If you like this taste of the uh, of what what what's going on in my head, I guess. Uh, leave a like. Please be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, it really helps out a lot to know what you guys like, what you guys don't like. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for subscribing. Love you guys so much. Love you guys so much. Uh, I will see you in the next video, whether it is a tutorial or it's a breakdown of another piece of gear. I'll see you there. Have a great day.